Gracious, eternal Father in heaven, we come now at another time which we can, Lord, come before your throne of grace in the name of Jesus. Asking, Lord, earnestly for thy Holy Spirit to take the words that you would implant to my mind upon my lips and, Lord, plant it in fertile soils of the heart. Let your Holy Spirit bring forth fruit. Let your angels be in our midst now, keeping back every distraction, seen and unseen, that would interfere with us hearing you speak to us, that we might be set free from every evil bondage that Satan puts upon us. Because with Christ's stripes, we are healed. And we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So this morning, or this afternoon, we're going to continue our presentation on the Elijah therapy. The Elijah therapy, and we're going to look at part two of Elijah therapy. You see that on the screen, right? Yesterday I put that on the screen. Now, someone very quickly explain that parachute from a spiritual perspective. A, op a closed parachute do not or does not work. So what does that have to do with us spiritually? A closed parachute. If you don't use the treatment, you won't get All right, you don't use the treatment, you won't get healed. All right. Yes, ma'am. Very good. Very good. If the heart and mind is closed, God cannot do anything for us when we have a closed mind. All he asks is a willing heart. And then we realize a parachute only works when it's open. When the heart is open to receive the impression of the Holy Spirit, it can do something for us. We realize that life does not have a remote control. It would be wonderful if we could click all of our problems away. But we got to get up and change it. Now, on the screen here, Psalms 100, verse 3, let's read that scripture together. What does it say? Let's read it together. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pastor. So we have discovered that God is the owner of this wonderful body, has given us an owner's manual, which is what? The Bible, because every product comes with a manufacturer owner's manual. And the instruction of that Bible, we find, we call it God's plan. All right, what's the first law up there on the screen? And the second law, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eight. God's plan. Or you call it new start or creation, but we call it God's plan. We place godly trust at the top for all the other laws hangs upon that one law, God's plan. All right, remember, we share with you an affordable health care plan. Did everyone get their health assurance program? Who did not get one of these? Can I see your hand? All right. Michael, don't we have some on the table? Why don't we get a few? I want everybody to have the health assurance program. So we realize that God has a wonderful health care program, affordable health care, living healthy without being wealthy. What y'all think about that, huh? Living healthy without being wealthy. So you remember old Bible care compared to Obama's care. So we have a Bible care. Now this plan that you receive is very basic and fundamental. Raise your hand, who did not get a health assurance plan? And therefore, the premium of this health assurance plan been paid for by the blood of Jesus. Paid in full. What qualify you for this health assurance program is your need. All you have to have is a need. Isn't that cheap enough? Healthcare program, God's plan. Dr. Trust, the Elijah Therapy. 
the black hole, part two. Let's turn to the book of James, chapter five. James, chapter five, as we let the Holy Spirit navigate us. James, chapter five, verses 17 and 15, I mean, 17 and 18. James chapter 5. Are you there with me? Verses 17 and 18. I read in your hearing. Elias was a man subject to like passion as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And verse 18. And he prayed again. And the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth fruit. Very important to understand this. The very first part, Elijah, subject to like passions. What does that mean? Elijah, subject to like passion unto men. Very quick, what does that mean? He was just like us. Hello. And when Christ came to this earth, did he come as a God? Did he come as a man? Oh, to identify, show him what a human being can do with the power of God living in him. Do you agree with that? Well, if you don't, what the Bible says is true. I agree with that. Keep that in mind. He came to demonstrate how life will look like when we allow God to come in. Anybody remember this? Every chicken comes from a crack home. What does that mean? Let's go back spiritually. God placed man on this earth in a perfect state, in a pristine environment. And it was God's perfect will that if Adam had maintained that connection with God, his seed, progenitated, would have been a holy seed. It would have filled this earth, that's God's original plan, with holy seed. You agree with that? So therefore, that's his original plan. Has that plan changed? No, it has not changed. We find that Adam forfeited his right, but the God's original plan has not changed. He still will produce holy seeds on this earth. Hello? He will have a group of people that will not have any gal or fault in their lives when he comes. He's coming not to take sinners home. So in Philippians chapter 3, 13 and 14, Paul said, I forget those things in the past. Keep that in mind. Press towards, that's what before me. Then he says, I press towards the mark, the prize, the high calling in Christ Jesus. The high calling, you've got to keep this in mind, is godliness, God-likeness. Hmm? You remember three Ds? Anybody remember the three Ds I said last, yesterday? Three D's, D. Destination, direction, decision. Did you get that? So what is our destination? Now listen, we all want to be saved, amen? But I think salvation is a byproduct of us becoming Christ-like. Did you hear what I just said? Salvation is a byproduct of us becoming Christ-like. If we attain that goal of godliness, salvation is there. Am I making sense to anybody? Look, I'm trying to be saved. I'm trying to be, no, we want to strive by God's grace for godliness. You get that? Simplify that. My destination is to be God-like by his power. My destination will be reached by the direction I take based on the decisions I make. Therefore, when I have a definite goal in life, that goal will shape my perception of life, and also it will serve as a barometer or parameter through which I make decisions. I make decisions in light of my destination. Am I making sense to you? Therefore, if I have been called for godliness, then every step I take must be in that direction. Let me give you a personal situation. My wife and I are from Chicago. 
So I was an advocate basketball player. And I remember when I entered high school, I think I was a junior, I wanted to try out for what you call the senior team, since I was tall and et cetera, et cetera. So I, I tried out for the senior team. I made the team. We had a coach. He was a military man. We were standing up there in the line after we made the team, excited. I got number 23 in my uniform. So he walked down the line, he looked at his face, he said, I do not, we do not want good basketball players. We want great basketball players. In order for you to be a great basketball player, you must eat, sleep, and drink basketball. That's what he told me. I got so excited, I could not wait to get home. Share with my mother, I made the team, she was excited for me. I could not wait till the sun set. Why? Because my coach said I must eat, sleep, and drink basketball. So when the sun set, took my bath, I put on number 23, my basketball uniform. I slept in my basketball uniform. So in the morning and rise, going to the restroom to wash up, my mother caught me by a peripheral vision, she said, boy, when you say boy, you got to stop. <laughs> Even if your leg is up there, it must pause in midair. <laughs> she came up to me, she looked me up and down as I followed her eyes. Ask a rhetorical question, what you have on, son? I looked myself up and down too, my basketball uniform. She said, did you sleep in that? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, don't you have pajamas? I said, yes, ma'am. Why are you sleeping in your basketball uniform? Now, what did my coach say? Tell me, tell us. I must eat, sleep, and drink basketball. That's what he told me. So I repeated what my coach said to that little old lady. I said, mom, you know I made the varsity team. She said, I'm, I'm excited for you, son. But what has to do you sleeping in your basketball uniform? Well, my coach told us. If we're going to be great basketball players, we got to eat, sleep, and drink basketball. She gave me a blank stare. She said, oh, that's right. OK, guess what you're going to have for breakfast today? <laughs> Did you get that? Since you slept in your uniform, he said, eat, sleep, and drink basketball. She said, you might as well, you're going to have basketball for your breakfast. <laughs> then reality check in. Then she said, son. What the coach was telling you, whatever you set your heart on, do it with all your strength, with your passion. That would determine the direction. See, basketball kept me from joining street gangs. Basketball kept me from becoming a drug addict. Basketball kept me from dropping out of school. Are you listening to me? I set my goal high. And therefore, I would not do anything. I would not take anything. And I was not even a, a professed Christian at that time. I would not eat, drink, smoke, anything that was going to interfere with me being a great basketball player. That's a, that's a secular, worldly goal. When you set your goal definitively, it dictates your whole life. Now, as Christians, that should be a problem. Amen? God calling us for godliness. So therefore, every one of us, after Adam fall, inherit a fallen nature, a fallen, sinful nature. Every chicken comes from a crack home. And God says here in the book of Psalms 51, verse 9, he said, Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So therefore, we were born in sin and shaped in sin. And God wants to restore us back to his original glory. We found out here that if the egg is broke, if the force of the egg is broke on the outside, that chicken would die. If the force of the crack starts on the inside, the chicken will live. We found out yesterday God never start outward working some inward. He start inward working outward. We read a statement. It says here, we must be delivered from his power within. God always work inward, ladies and gentlemen. And here in Philippians chapter 2, it says here, for it is God which worketh in you both to will 
and to do of his good pleasure. Thank God he take flawed people to bring hope to a flawed world. Romans 12, 2. God said, let us, be, let us not be conformed to this world, but be what? Transformed by the what? Now, why should our mind? Now, look at the text now. Why our mind must be transformed? What does it say? In re- what? Because it says here that I or you may be able to prove what is what? That good and acceptable will of God. Without a transformed mind, we cannot approve what is good. We cannot even know the acceptable will of God. Did you get that? That's what it says. That's why many of us are studying the Bible without a transformed mind and why it doesn't make any sense to us and why it does not have the impact that it's supposed to do to purge us. And therefore, we discover God has placed eternity in our hearts. God has created us with a DNA to worship. In Proverbs 20 through 7, it says, For as I think in my heart, what? What I think I am, I am. So therefore, thoughts produce action. Action, habits, habits form character. Character determine my destiny. So if I have a problem in my habitual life, where should I start working at? I got to start with the thought process. If I'm addicted to drugs, sugar, sex, et cetera, et cetera, you can go to sexual behavior modification program, behavior modification program. It lasts for a period of time. You got to get to the root. Those addictions are nothing but fruit. You cannot kill a tree by plucking off leaves. Hmm? You got to get to the root, the heart. Heart. Very important to understand that. It's a heart problem. Go with me to the book of John Chapter 10, as we move forward. John chapter 10. And let's look at verse 10. John 10. Let's read the whole thing. I'll read in your hearing. John 10, 10. Are you there with me? Notice what the Bible says here. The thief... Coming not, but to what? And to do what? And to? Now keep that in mind. Listen, ladies and gentlemen. We have two entities here, two supernatural powers. We have the thief, then we have the one who said, I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it what? So we see the two powers in the controversy, Christ and the adversary. So therefore, human beings are not your enemy. Do you get what I'm saying? The person who insults you, the person who abuse you, the person who accuse you is not the enemy. What y'all think about that? <laughs> I love those amen. I pray that you really believe that. So, you know, it's just like the human body. When we talk about autoimmune condition, you see, in the United States Army, Air Force, Navy, they have certain experience what they call friendly fire. How many men, military folks, know what friendly fire? Friendly fire. Mm-hmm. What does that mean, friendly fire? When you're mistaken, that's right, when you're mistaken your friend for the enemy. Did you get that? So autoimmune condition, the same thing. The immune system lose self-recognition and turn his weaponry upon the body tissue. That's why we have allergic reaction. So we have spiritual autoimmune disorder. So when someone insults us, when someone abuses us, which there's consequences of that, but God wants us to be able to respond in the midst of that abuse in a way that Christ's life can be demonstrated through us for the redemption of the abuser. Because the true abuser is the accuser, which is the adversary of God, working through the frailty and the weakness of humanity. And so we put our weaponry on one another. And when we shoot at one another, all we're doing is attacking our own body. Come on, talk to me. 
So we got to set free. We got to step out of our humanness and work in the realm of supernatural because God want to live his life through me. And when someone is insulting me, because ladies and gentlemen, if we cannot pass the quizzes, we're not going to pass the final test. So praise God for the trials. Praise God for the suffering. Praise God for the disappointments because it is preparing us. So God inhabits the praise of his people. So if the devil comes to steal life, he comes to steal our mental health. Mm. We found out nine-tenths of all diseases of the spiritual nature. I'm not going to spend more time on that. I shared that yesterday. We find that the physician must realize that he's not warned against human nature. He's warned against the originator of disease. We realize man is made of a three qualities, physical, mental, and spiritual. John 5, 6, will that be whole? We discover that Christ's method of healing always embraced the whole person. You see that in Matthew 9, verse 1 through 8. We realize that God tells us to be a good cheer because discouragement and depression. Last time I was here, I gave you a handout. How many received the handout this morning? On that handout, you'll find the 10 tail signs of depression. So if you don't have a handout, just let us know. We'll be sure you get one. Let's move on to see what God has in store for number two, the black hole. Hopeless feeling. Lessons from the life and experience of Elijah. Elijah, subject to like passion, like you and I. Elijah, normal human being, he hungered, he was weary, he feared, he despaired. All in 1 Kings chapter 19, man like passion, made up of the same material that you and I, experienced the same thing that you and I experienced. That's on your sheet. Miracles he performed, declared a drought, widows all multiplied. Raised the widow's dead son. Called down fire from heaven. This is Elijah, man of like passion. Like passion. The Elijah message, you'll find it recorded in the book of Matthew 11, Luke 1, Malachi chapter 4, Revelation 11, 6, Luke chapter 9. We are to bear the Elijah message. Translated, didn't see death. God is looking to produce 144,000 living saints that will never see death. The Elijah therapy, this is all taken from the book of 1 Kings, chapters 18 and 19. You have an outline in your hand. In 1 Kings, chapter 19, you'll see, number one, you see the condition there. The condition, after he had that signal victory on Mount Carmel, Powerful victory. Declare war on the prophets of Baal. Led Ahab chariot to the gate of Jezreel in a thunderstorm. And got to the point as he slept outside, then Jezebel ranted. So number one, you see A, his life was threatened. Keep that in mind. We want to see how it's applied to us. Number two, he feared for his life. Number three, he focused on the what? Circumstances. Please do not let these reading be mechanical to you. He focused on the circumstances. He lost hope and wanted to die. This is a man of God. You show me a strong man, I show me a strong man, I show you a weak man. We all are susceptible to this experience. And we do go through the experience. Let's repeat this very quickly. Number one, his life was threatened. Jezebel threatened him. By this time tomorrow, I'm going to feed your body to the buzzards. B, through that threaten, he feared for his life. Number C, he focused on the circumstance. He focused on the problem. Are you problem-oriented or solution-oriented? Mm. All right. In 
important to understand that. He lost hope and wanted to die. Conditions. Let's look at some causes and factors here. Causes. He was, this is verse 3 and 4, he was self-focused. Did you get that? Talking about depression. He was self-focused. That's what created those conditions. B, he allowed circumstances to dictate his actions. We all have that situation. We find ourselves in crisis. We allow circumstances to dictate our decisions. Anybody have that? No, man. Just, just confess the truth, shame the devil. Most definitely. C, he, listen to this. He had high expectation. Someone quickly go to Psalm 62, verse 5. Let your finger do the walking. He had high expectation. What was his expectation? Come on, talk to me real quickly. What was Elijah's expectation? It's, we got some expectation in the church here. What was Elijah's expectation? Come on, talk to me. All right, that's Psalm 625. Then I raised the question before that. I raised the question, what was Elijah's expectation? Huh? No, 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 no. You ain't getting it. <clears throat> Not Jezebel, no. Let me, for the sake of time. He expected a reformation in Israel. Are you listening to me? <clears throat> Elijah's expectation was to see a reformation. After that single defeat on Mount Carmel, he expected that Ahab, spiritual weak man, would take a position. He expected Israel would follow suit and make a reformation. That was his expectation. Are you listening to me? Now look at it now. And the Bible says in Psalm 62, 5, what does it say? Let me read it so everybody can hear this. Listen to what it says. I'll read it for you. It says, my soul wait thou only upon who? God. <clears throat> for my expectation is from him. Now, we got we to gotta reconcile this a little bit. Okay, I've been married for 47 years. That, yeah, praise the Lord. All legs and feet. Honey, raise your hand there. Are you out there? There she is right there. My bride from my side, my queen from my spleen. Now, <laughs> we, we both got job description. From the Lord. Come on, talk. I don't need to tell my wife, here's your job description. God already gave her a job description. He gave me a job description. Now, my job description is found in Ephesians chapter 5. From verse 20 on down. Men folk, you read that. So therefore, my expectation, if I have unrealistic expectation for my wife, I'm setting myself up for disappointment. You ain't get what I just said. You know how we men expect things from our wives and our wives expect things from us? When God is in your heart, he lives out all of that which is required. You know, I got a friend I just met. I asked him a question at lunchtime, one time. I said, you try to love your wife? He said, what? He said, I love her anyway. <laughs> Spontaneously. Huh? No matter what. So Elijah had expectation from Israel that did not come to fruition. And when he heard the threatenings, that just drove it. He allowed circumstances, had high expectation. Now, I'm not saying that there's no responsibility. Like in ministry, there are job descriptions in ministries. Now, for me, I don't know about the leaders of this ministry, but I've learned since four years ago, my expectation got to be realistic through the eyes of God. We have a small ministry, about 20 folks working. Therefore, we have a good relationship. There's challenges. But if I have expectations of people 
that I know without God's power they can fulfill, I'm setting myself up for depression. Now, when you enlist in God's army, he gives you a job description. So when you join a ministry like Harlan or Meek Ministry or any ministry, it's already criteria, so the criteria is already there. And so you just have to encourage, and if a person do not want to meet the criteria, you gently encourage them, maybe there's another place that God has you to call, call to. You don't get stressed out over that. I don't get anxiety over that. Everybody got a place for God. I mean, God has a place for him. Let's listen to what it says here. Elijah had what? Expected much from the miracle wrought on common. He had hoped that after this display of God's power, Jezebel would no longer have influence over the mind of Ahab. Did you get that? Ooh-wee. That's what really shook him up, that this miracle was to be convincing. Now, let me say this in the area of help. Do you know facts do not change people? Facts. I'm quite sure people, I give hundreds of health lectures. I put information, statistics, facts together, people smoking, showing how the lungs all turn into shredded wheat. Do you know there's a restaurant called Jack? What's that restaurant called? Heart Attack Grill. How many heard of Heart Attack Grill? It's in Las Vegas. All right. This guy gets on national TV showing his restaurant with the ashes of a dead body who died from his food. Are you listening to me? He tells you that his food kills you. This is not a secret. We were doing some meetings in Las Vegas, and we heard that the Heart Attack Grill was there. I said, honey, let's go down. Let's go to Heart Attack Grill. They had a big scale out there. If you weigh 350 pounds, you can get in free. The, wait the waitress, they all dressed in scanty nurses' uniforms, stethoscope around their neck. You got to pay before you get in. So my wife and I both got on the scale. We did not make 350. So we peep through the window, see what's going on. Heart attack grill. It's already known it kills you. He had what you call triple bypass burgers, quadruple bypass burger. Those are facts. You could, I mean, a dead with the ashes of a dead body. And people line up going to a heart attack grill. Facts do not change people. Are you listening to me? I'm not saying show the statistics. But you're not going to convince nobody of statistics. It's going to be the power of God to change folks. Every message must have the power of God. I've been doing this for 42 years, giving people facts. <laughs> They're still smoking and drinking. Do I have one, one person understand what I'm saying? I'm not telling you don't present the facts, but facts do not convert. Facts do not change people. Only the power of God. And the message must display that power. To every educator, to every preacher, to every medical doctor, I can get up and give you all the statistics. I've not seen one fact change somebody's life in my 42 years, but I've seen the power of God. Are you listening to me? Elijah had expectation. Then it says here, and that there would be a speedy what? Reform throughout Israel. All day on Carmel's height, he had toil without food. Yet when he guided the chariot of Ahab to the gate of Jezreel, his courage was strong, despite the physical strain under which he had labor. Are you listening? Power. Let's go to the next statement. This is what it says here. But a reaction such as frequently followed High faith and glorious success was pressing upon Elijah. What did he do? He feared that the reformation begun on Carmel might not be lasting and depression seized him. Did you get that? Expectation 
that is not fulfilled will lead you and I to discouragement and depression. He had been, listen to what it said, he had been called to Pisgah's top. Now he was in the valley. While under the inspiration of the Almighty, he has stood the severest trial of faith. But in his what? Time of what? With Jezebel's threat sounding in his ear and Satan still apparently prevailing through the plotting of the wicked woman, of this wicked woman. He lost his hold on God. He had been called above measure and the reaction was tremendous. Forgetting God, Elijah fled on and on until he found himself in a dreary, wasted, waste alone. Pause. Let that saturate our minds. Have anybody have had similar experience of Elijah? It's in your life. I know I have, most definitely. The more I focus, it drives you further and further into despondency. Elijah, a man of like passion. He feared. Keep this in mind. He was self-focused. He was shaped by circumstances. He had high expectations. That's all on your sheet. Let's move on quickly. The cause, let's put it in perspective. Number one, disappointment. Number two, resentment. Number three, anger. Number four, self-pity, if only. Is that on your sheet? You see that? Let this be internalized personally because we're all going to face it. We don't have to face depression, but we're going to face situations that are going to challenge us. You get what I'm saying? I'm not saying when you face a situation, you've got to be depressed because you don't have to be depressed. Hello out there. Because Jesus proved the fact we do not have to go into depression because he endured despair. He endured abuse. He endured rejection. Did he not do that? given us a perfect example that we too can have the same experience as Jesus Christ had. Thank you for that one amen. That's all right. That's all right. That's all right. I know y'all like just sit in meetings and listen to the preacher, but I'm telling you, this is practical information. This here follows you and I. I know that. That's why we are not moving forward as a church because we're not getting to the heart of the matter. We've got to be free from our emotional insecurities. and We've got to be free from the rejection. We've got to be free from our past hurts. We sweep it under the rug, and that rug get lumpy. Then that rug, those lumps turn into stones, and God said, I'm going to take away the stony heart. I'm going to take away that stone that has rejection. That stone that has abuse. Are you, that's what the stone. Just don't generalize. There are stones in your life, in my life. We got to understand. We got to say, Lord, show me those stones. They could be blind spots that we don't see. That's why God permit trials. I told some people, I said, trials do not perfect your and my character. Character is revealed in trials. Did you get what I just said? Do not go around boasting that you have a thousand trials and God is perfecting your character. He is not perfecting your character. He is revealing what's in your wicked heart. That he can take it when you give him permission. If you never had a conflict crisis, you would never know you still have bitterness in your heart. Resentment and unforgiveness. And God allowed that crisis to reveal to you the darkness in the chambers of the heart. And I said, Lord, praise you for that. 
reveal to me what's in that heart in this trial. I don't go to God's Lord. The trial is, I know you're trying to perfect my character. Uh uh-uh, uh, son, I'm trying to reveal your character. Am I making sense to two people? And when you read from John chapter 15, 1 through 3, just basically that God said, I'm going to purge you. I'm going to purge you that you bear forth fruit. Persian, that means he's going to prune us. And the word of God is the pruning too. And verse 3 said, you are clean through the word. When a crisis come to me, when there's conflict, and when I recognize I'm rising up with bitterness and resentment in my heart, because tomorrow morning, uh, Sabbath, I'm going to deal with the healing power of forgiveness. That's something that we need to understand. And when God allow me to be faced with a situation that has produced in me resentment and bitterness, that trial is God's diagnostic too. And then I need to turn the microscope on that God may look inward to my heart. And then he provide a word for me. The word offers the solution for the trial. If I have bitterness in my heart, resentment in my heart, unforgiveness in my heart, and God comes to the word, comes to me and says, love him as I loved you. Forgive him as I forgive you. Now that's what shakes us up. Come on, talk to me. Amen. Somebody go out and steal your wife, steal your car. I mean, I mean, horrific stuff. And you mean, yeah, I'm going to forgive him, but I won't forget it. Go read Jeremiah 31, 34. God said, I forgive your iniquity and I remember your sins no more. Now, that remember does not deal with memory. It deals with covenant. God promised I would treat you. When you come to me and confess your sins, I am faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all your sin. I will treat you the way your sin don't deserve, like you never sinned. He takes the penalty on himself. So when someone offend me, I must be redempted in my dealings with that person. Did anybody? One person heard that. <laughs> Not punitive. Let's move on. Therefore, is it like one minute of anger? Suppress your immune system for how long? Y- 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 y'all sleep out there? I'm trying to help your anger. Come on. The story of John Hunter, a British surgeon. He said, my life is at the mercy of any scoundrel that put me into a passion. One day, John Hunter and his colleague got into a heated discussion. John Hunter went out, he just slammed the door and went out to the next room into his office and dropped dead. True story. Anger, huh? Anger. I'm not a, a father of confusion, but this statement is very true. An angry man is always full of poison. <laughs> Do those folks look happy to you? Anger, bitter, unforgiving spirit produce negative chemical byproducts. Life destroying. If you look at Daniel chapter 8, verse 7, you'll see the he goat and the ram. You remember that? Daniel 8, 7. You find here, it says that it ran into that, what? With, with, like, with cola, passion, anger. That's what it says. And that word cola deals with anger, irritation. Look at that word cola. Look at that word cola. Irritability deals with bile, the liver. So anger affects your liver, (laughs) like cholesterol. Anger. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. What time we got here? All right. Now, One minute of laughter will do what? It stimulates your immune system for 24 hours. While one minute of anger suppresses it for six hours. That's why it's always have a smile on your face. And so we attempt to find the cause. Let me, we won't go through all of this, but let me get to some closing points here. Treating the depression. We got to find the cause. Depression comes as a result, you know, 
we are told that those of us with anxious hearts, anxious heart, we have not made a complete surrender to God. Did you hear what I'm saying? We look, see, fear look through our circumstances at God. Faith look at our circumstances through the eyes of God. We always place fear and circumstances above everything else. You read 2 Chronicles 20, 20. You read about Jehoshaphat face with a multitude of a problem. He said he feared, but that fear was a fear that he turned to God because he said, I have no might against this multitude. So he began to praise God. You know, there's a statement here, wrap it up. William Cole, Kyle Pepper, the writer of the hymn, There's a Fountain, attempted suicide numerous times. He was committed to insane asylums four times. At his darkest hour, he found refuge in the home of John Newton. You know who John Newton was? Then he became a man of God. As he was encouraged and strengthened with hope, he became whole and eventually wrote 67 hymns. In the darkest hour, God brings treasure out of darkness. He brings treasure. The Bible says, why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquiet within me? Hope in God. For I shall yet praise him who is the help of my countenance. Hope in God. We are troubled on every side. But remember this, not cast out. He sent his word and healed them. Here's the solution to Elijah. Number one, sleep. Number two, touch, emotional stability, food, water, social attention, support, exercise, spiritual food. That's where we find this at. Go to 1 Kings 19. Sleep, touch, food, water, social attention, exercise, spiritual support. This was Elijah therapy. This is what he needed. You find all that in the word of God. Elijah received a therapy that embraced the whole person, mental, spiritual, and physical. That's on your sheet there. When you get under depressed, you want to isolate yourself. That's the most dangerous thing you can do is to isolate yourself. We find when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, they discovered that they were naked, they were shamed, and they hid themselves. Is that what they did? They feared. Mental illness started in the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve disconnected themselves from a loving Savior, all of the effects of shame, guilt, isolation, self-focus, blame, all of that manifested itself. And this is no attack on the educational institution, but my wife was sharing a statement with me. I think you were sharing about the heart disease, something like this, or attitude. How did that go real quickly? That he said that there's the attitude. The doctor was talking about that was no. I'll repeat it. And then what did he say there about attitude that it can't be changed? Something like that. that's what got me. What it says. You, Then he further stated, because you, I read, you read, he said, it, it can't be changed. Is that what he says? I'm trying to, I want to quote right. But here's the point. What she was reading in this document, that attitude had a great deal to do with the disposition, the physiological of the heart. 
And most people ain't changed their attitude. And so we don't know. He said we don't know how to change the attitude, which is true. But can the attitude be trained? Yes, because Proverbs 23, 7 says, out of the what? My heart, the mouth thinketh. So God said, I need a new thought pattern. Now, this is, what I, this is a statement. I shared it last night. Therefore, God wants our hearts. You agree with that? I shared the other day, not last night. I shared that you and I cannot give God our hearts. They don't belong to you and I. They belong to God by creation and redemption. But what we are told that we can give him permission to take this heart. you got to keep this in mind. People say, well, when I gave my heart to the Lord. Because I used to say that too. That's why I had an experience four or five years ago recognizing that I had not been truly transformed because I'm trying to give God something that already belonged to him that I can't give. Are you listening to me? Huh? So therefore, if we're going to move from this state of bondage and depression because of our past lives, that we need to confess it to God. If there are individuals in our lives that are still alive that we have done harm or wrong to them, we need to seek them out and confess our faults to them. I've done that. Many of them are dead, but God don't hold us accountable for that. You got to relinquish your past to God. You got to relinquish it. You got to ask God, say, Lord, take this heart of mine. Because it belongs to you. I cannot give it to you. Keep it pure for thy name's sake. Save me in spite of my self, my unchristlike self. Shape, mold, fashion this heart until it become completely entire like Jesus. And raise me up into the pure atmosphere of heaven that the current of your love may flow through me to my wife, my fellow workers, my children, my enemies. Are you with me? That has to be a prayer. And I want to pray this afternoon with you. Therapy is good. You need counseling. As I said yesterday, the devil loves to hear you and I talk about our problems, our discouragement with other people. He loves to hear us. Other words is no use. We hopeless. He delights in bringing us into bondage. Every problem, every challenge in life is a call for prayer. Amen. Before you contact with a human being, and I trust this church, whether you're on Facebook, Twitter, Jitter, don't put your life out there. Use it for a medium to share the gospel. I'm telling you, the devil cannot read our thoughts. He hear our words. He watch our action. He has years of understanding the human heart. So he specialized in temptation exactly for you and me. Are you listening to me? I'm not me. That's what God says. Learn to trust the man of Calvary. He will deliver you. Elijah came out of that cave. Elijah was delivered from that cave. Elijah continued his pace, his race at God's pace. God want to bring us out of that dark hole. Tap in. For a suggested reading on some thoughts, 
Anybody familiar with mind, character, and personality? Take this down, because I cut it off. off. <coughs> volume two, volume two of mind, character, and personality. The chapter, the chapter, depression. The chapter, depression. Hmm? Let's read it. You'll find some hope and encouragement there. So how many just want to have a serious moment of prayer here? And this is what the prayer should be like. I want to come to a place in my life that I want to relinquish my right to control my life in the hands of a loving God. That's the prayer I want to pray with those who want to take this step. That I want to acknowledge that I have not truly gave God the right to control my life. That's what happened to me four or five years ago when God told me in this work for 38 years at that time that son, you 90%, you relinquish 90% of your life, but you still got a God complex in you. You're still trying to fix people's lives. You're trying, to, you're trying to do my work at your own expense and thinking. So to trust God, that means you come to God with a blank sheet of paper. You don't come with God with something written on it. You come, Lord, will you go and write down on this paper your plan for me today? Every day. God said in Isaiah 27, 1 through 3, I water you moment by moment. I keep you day and night. To trust God means to fully surrender my right in the hands of God and watch him do something supernatural. I testify of that. I want to pray with those who, it might be a scary situation, but God said, if you have a willing heart, I will do something supernatural. Anybody with me here? If you want to... Let's come up and let's pray together. Let's pray for this prayer that God, we give him consent to take control of these lives that once and for all, the power of the adversarial soul will be taken off our lives. My family, remember we only have one enemy and one friend. Our friend is Jesus. And that enemy is the adversary of souls. When we relate to one another, as Jesus was dealing with Peter, when Peter was trying to just rebuke Christ, and Christ said, get thee behind me, Satan. We know that he was not calling Peter Satan. We know that Satan had insinuated himself through the weakness of Peter. So God was able to separate the behavior from the person. Did you get what I'm saying? That he was still able to love Peter and hate the behavior. I want to be that type of person. When someone is going off, someone is acting crazy, maybe I'm acting crazy, I want to be able to say, just display, if I got to get correctness, if I got to get rebuke, I want to be able to give a rebuke without damaging the flower. That's supernatural. We can't do that in a human strength. In the old, in the old saying in the South, we throw the baby out with the dishwater. When, he, when my brother messes up, he goes out with it. Am I making sense? To I want God to give that power. Amen. Time is shrinking. He's given us the Elijah message to prepare people to stand true to him during this time of investigative judgment. May this be our prayer. Father God in heaven, we thank you for the precious moment we do have in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, one who is touched with the feelings of our infirmities, one who stands between the living and the dead, mediating of the holies of a heavenly sanctuary that we come boldly to the throne of grace in time of need. Father, you have spoken. We have heard. Now we cry out to you. 
We recognize that we cannot give you these hearts of ours because they don't belong to you. We give you permission to take that which is rightfully yours and that you will keep them pure for their namesake and that you will uh, shape, mold these hearts until they become like the heart of Jesus. And Lord, give us a spirit of perseverance. Give us a spirit that we can, Lord, relinquish our despair through the power of the faith of Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that we will become people of the word of God. Our devotional life will take on a new dimension. Our prayer life will become more intense and fervent. And the whole trajectory of our life will change so we can see the bigger picture, the high calling, godliness. And even though we're going to go through trials, we thank you for the trials. We're going to go through suffering. We thank you for the suffering because they are designed to reveal what's hidden from our own eyes of these hearts of ours. And we thank you for that. So, Lord, add your pruning tool to these hearts. Cleanse us. Sanctify us. And create us a clean heart. And Lord, when this conference is over with, I pray, Father, we can leave from here being a light to the world. So bring out treasure out of darkness. And put your hands upon every soul. Let your sweet spirit surround us. Let our influence be a savior unto life and not unto death. Uphold us, for you are our strength. You are our wisdom. You are our hope. And in you, we find the joy and the peace, and the grace. Go with your people. Be with us as we continue on in our conference. But let these thoughts not fall on hard grounds. Water these seeds that will bring fruit to your name and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray for his name's sake. Amen. Amen.